Chapter 5 is a gish gallop of disinformation aimed at selling the idea that scientists know the universe is intelligently designed and is just denying it because of anti-supernatural bias. And like with any gish gallop, it gets tedious to look up every single quote mine and spurious accusation. So today we's going to take a step back and look at some of the underlying assumptions that's behind Gosler and Turek's flailing. Hey there folks, Bertram the Barely Bearable Atheist here, continuing our series on the book I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norm Gosler and Frank Turk. Chapter 5 is supposed to be about the origin of life on Earth, but predictably, you ain't going to find a whole lot of information here about the actual origin of life research. Instead, Gosler and Turk is offering us a smorgasbord of bad assumptions, equivocations, quote mines, slanders, and the rest of the usual squares you'll find on a creationist bingo card. We's up to it this section entitled, quote, Good Science versus Bad Science, unquote, and of course they's trying to argue that creationism is good science and biology, chemistry, cosmology, and so on are all bad sciences. As you might expect, it's a gish gallop of quote minds, misleading analogies, and ad hominem fallacies. Many of the quotes is from creationists, intelligent design proponents, and panspermia proponents, but they ain't never identified as such. Or, well, the, the panspermia guys are, but, well, how many conservative Christian laymen today even know what panspermia is? I mean, it ain't a very informative acknowledgement. Some of the quotes, though, do come from legitimate scientists declaring that materialism is a necessary component of scientific investigation, which fits right into Geisler and Turk's agenda of portraying scientists as being unreasonably biased against the possibility of a supernatural origin of life. So for our first topic today, let's take some time to consider the real reasons why scientists might express such apparently dogmatic prejudices against creationist explanations. There's three reasons, or I should say at least three reasons, why there's more to the situation than a simplistic us versus them mentality would have us believe. The first is that there ain't no scientific way to make a meaningful distinction between the natural and the supernatural. We ain't got some atheistic book giving us a comprehensive list of everything that's natural such that anything outside of that list must be supernatural. Nor is there any kind of test that we could reliably and verifiably apply in order to detect whether any particular phenomenon is natural or supernatural. The only distinction science can reliably make is whether or not something is verifiable or unverifiable. That's it. If there was some kind of supernatural phenomenon that could be repeatably and verifiably determined to be real, science would neither know nor care whether it was natural or supernatural. If you find some set of magic words that can reliably and verifiably transmute lead into gold, science will document it, publish it in peer-reviewed literature, and accept it as genuine, which would then raise the question of whether such a transmutation was really supernatural or just some new aspect of the natural world that we ain't encountered before. And that's part of the problem. One of the defining characteristics of the supernatural is that science can't explain it or verify it. But as soon as the supernatural enters into the realm of things that can be observed and verified and studied, they become scientific and cease to be supernatural. We've seen this happen over and over with lightning and diseases and on and on and on. So accusing scientists of some kind of anti-supernatural bias sets up a set of self-moving goalposts. Because as soon as science starts studying stuff that's verifiably real, <laughs> it ain't supernatural no more. The second problem is that appealing to supernatural causes can't never actually explain nothing. A genuine scientific explanation describes specifically how various observable, verifiable materials and or processes interact to produce whatever we's trying to explain. And in the process, the explanation gives us a greater understanding of how things work in the real world above and beyond what we was originally trying to explain. And that's what makes science so useful and important. And supernatural accounts don't do that. Supernatural accounts can't do that. All that supernatural accounts do is attribute things to various beings and powers that, by definition, lie outside of our ability to scientifically investigate them.
They tell us exactly zero about how the real world actually works. And science just ain't interested in any of that. I mean, sure, you can believe in stuff like that if you want to, but what's the point? Science is all about understanding objective reality. And any so-called supernatural stuff outside of our ability to observe and verify is basically irrelevant. Third, a miracle by definition means something that's blatantly inconsistent with the way objective reality actually works, at least as we experience it. And by strange coincidence, that's also the definition of something that ain't true. To be genuinely miraculous, a miracle has to contradict our understanding of the world around us, just like falsehoods do. Consequently, embracing miracles would wreak havoc on the scientific method. If one researcher publishes suspicious results and no other researcher can reproduce them, would that mean that the first researcher was wrong, or would it mean that they had experienced a miracle? Embracing miracles as valid scientific explanations would mean that virtually nothing would be falsifiable anymore. God works in mysterious ways, so every reported result would have to be considered to be at least potentially miraculous and true. Science as we know it would be effectively dead, and research would be effectively over. Which, you know, I don't know, maybe Gosler and Turk think that'd be an improvement. I mean, it'd eliminate a major competitor, and we could all go back to using religious wars to decide whose side God was really on. So, any way you slice it, supernaturalism is fundamentally incompatible with a skeptical investigation of reality. And a lot of scientists consider this to be fairly obvious and the elementary foundations of scientific understanding, so they don't waste a lot of time elaborating on the details. They just say things like, we reject supernatural explanations and only materialistic explanations are scientific, which unfortunately gives apologists plenty of fodder for their ad hominem arguments against successful scientists. But the scientists ain't wrong. The way real scientists do science is the only possible way to do science. Simply lifting a hand wave in the general direction of heaven and attributing things to invisible beings who happen to have a suspicious fondness for your opinion to how other folks ought to behave, that ain't never going to be good science. So contrary to Geisler and Turek's frantic protestations and accusations, the good scientist is the ones who insist on real-world observability, repeatability, and verifiability. And that covers most of the quotes and accusations of this section of Chapter 5. But there's one other quote I think we ought to look at here, and that's from Hubert Yawkey, a physicist and information scientist whose particular expertise is in the field of information science. In his book, Information Theory and Molecular Biology, Yawkey writes, quote, The belief that life on Earth arose spontaneously from non-living matter is simply a matter of faith in strict reductionism and is based entirely on ideology, end quote. And obviously that sounds right in line with Geisler and Turk's thesis that believers is the true skeptics and skeptics is the true believers, which of course is why they included this quote and why I suspect they probably added the italics. But you know, something tells me that Geisler and Turk may not be giving us an honest presentation of what Yawkey actually believes. I did a little bit of research and I found a paper published by Yawkey in 1981 in the Journal of Theoretical Biology on the topic of self-organization, origin of life scenarios, and information theory. So right on topic for the question of whether molecules can self-organize into living biological structures. And in the abstract of this paper, Yawkey writes this, quote, it is concluded that at present, there are no scientifically valid origin of life scenarios. Consequently, belief in little green men in outer space is purely religious and not scientific. End quote. And this time the italics is Yaki's. So I think he wants to emphasize that his remarks only apply to the mechanisms that had been proposed as of about four and a half decades ago, which is a long time. And origin of life research has come a long way since then. Yawkey ain't denying that a natural origin of life is still a possibility. He's just saying that as of 1981, we weren't there yet. So it sounds like yet another out-of-context quote mine by disingenuous apologists and creationists. No surprise there. But it does bring up an interesting topic, and I think I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about what quote-unquote information is and why creationist uses of the term are complete bunk. So the first thing to note 
is that information is an abstraction. It's something we think and perceive about an object, not a physical property of the object itself. For example, suppose someone slips you a note in class with the word hi written on it. There's information in that note, but where exactly is that information? The writing itself is just four lines and a dot representing the sound hi. But the writing doesn't make the sound hi, it's just a symbolic representation of the sound. And in fact, in Japanese, the same sound is represented by a different set of marks. Okay, so maybe the meaning is in the sound. The sound hi conveys a friendly greeting in English. In Japanese, it conveys agreement or confirmation. And even in English, the sound hi can mean hello, or it can mean intoxicated, or it can mean elevated above ground level, and on and on. So the specific information ain't an attribute of the sound itself, just like the sound was not an attribute of the markings on the paper. We derive the meaning in our minds by considering the markings, the sound, the language, and the context. The information, in other words, is something we rebuild inside our own minds based on both perceptions and learned conventions of meaning. Consequently, this type of information does indeed presume and require some kind of mind both to transmit the message and to receive it. I call this kind of information conceptual information. It's conceived by an intelligent mind, reduced to symbolic form, transmitted to a recipient, perceived by the recipient, and decoded and reconstructed by the recipient in their mind. And that's the kind of information that Gosser and Turk is referring to when they talk about the information contained in a thousand sets of encyclopedias. And they's right that we wouldn't expect a thousand sets of encyclopedias to arise spontaneously through ordinary natural laws, but they's wrong about why not. This kind of information don't arise spontaneously because it's symbolic, with several layers of abstraction between the symbols that's used and the things the symbols represent and nature don't generate things that way. But there's another kind of information that I call observational information. If your car is parked out on a street and you come out one morning and find a dent in your door and your side mirror missing and heavy black tire tracks leading right up to where the dent is that weren't there when you parked your car, there's information in them tire tracks regarding what happened to your car. Or to use another example, if there's a violent flash flood that leaves behind all sorts of rocks and boulders and other debris, and if we know that as water slows down, the heavier things settle out first, then we can look at the location and size distribution of the rocks and boulders and whatnot and make some pretty reliable calculations as to how fast the water was moving, what direction it was going, and where it started to slow down and by how much. And notice, that ain't symbolic conceptual information. That's the physical properties of the objects themselves, such as their size and weight and location. And okay, if you want to get technical, it ain't actually information until we look at it and decide we want to measure their size and weight and location and calculate the water speed and direction and so on. But the point is, that's information that did not exist prior to the flood. These information that was spontaneously generated by the natural processes of geology and hydrodynamics. Non-symbolic, Observational information does arise spontaneously through natural forces, and that's precisely the kind of information that arises in complex organic molecules when they spontaneously self-organize into more complex biological structures. So Gassler and Turk's attempt to compare the origin of life with the origin of symbolic messages is like comparing apples to a scientific dissertation on the evolution of oranges. They ain't nowhere near similar enough to justify any kind of meaningful comparison, Gossler and Turk's main argument in this chapter is just pure flim-flammery. And let's see, that about covers what I want to say about naturalism and information, but maybe we can squeeze in the next section of chapter 5 entitled, Give Time and Chance a Chance. Now, the main theme of this section is a standard creationist misrepresentation of the second law of thermodynamics. Quote, You say, maybe natural laws would do it if we give them billions of years. No, they wouldn't. Why? Because nature disorders. It doesn't organize things. The fact that nature brings things towards disorder is another aspect of the second law of thermodynamics. End quote. 
They go on to give the analogy of dropping red, white, and blue confetti from an airplane a thousand feet above the ground to see if it lands in the shape of an American flag. If you drop the confetti from 10,000 feet instead of just 1,000 feet so that natural laws have longer to work on the confetti, does that increase the odds that it will form a perfect U.S. flag? Well, of course it don't, because fallen confetti ain't constrained by the same physical laws as biochemical reactions. Duh. Seriously, this is how they quote-unquote prove that life can't arise spontaneously? <sighs> I suppose it's possible that Gossler and Turk just plain don't know enough about chemistry to realize how flat-out dumb this argument is. The notion that the second law of thermodynamics somehow prevents molecules from organizing into complex biological structures is one of the oldest and most debunked creationist claims of all time. Babies can't grow up. Nutrients in food can't be used once the food is digested. Plants can't photosynthesize. Because if the second law means things can only decay, then none of that stuff can happen. Geisler and Turk even admit that the second law don't prevent things from growing and becoming more complex. But then they claim that this only happens in living systems. Quote, the point is we're not talking about what something can do once it's alive. We're talking about getting a living thing in the first place. How did life arise from non-living chemicals without intelligent intervention when non-living chemicals are susceptible to the second law? End quote. And I have some bad news for Gossler and Turk. All chemicals is non-living, whether they're part of a living organism or not. Life just ain't something that occurs at the molecular level. All chemicals is just atoms and molecules, and they all obey the same chemical laws, and they's all equally subject to the second law of thermodynamics. They ain't no special exception for quote-unquote living chemicals. See, this is, this is a kind of fundamental misconception that prevents Gasser and Turk from even remotely comprehending original life research. They think that life is some magical force that defies the laws of nature. They think that the laws of chemistry is different depending on the presence or absence of life. They think there's some kind of magical life energy that makes it possible for photosynthesis and nutrition to organize non-living molecules into complex biological structures in defiance of the second law, and that outside of a living system you can't do that. And fortunately for the plastics and chemical industry, that ain't true at all, because them folks run chemical re reactions all the time to assemble simpler molecules into more complex structures without ever violating the second law. It ain't that life is magic, it's just that Gosler and Turk's understanding of the second law is twisted by their need to turn it into something they can use as evidence for their God. And the give chance a chance part of their argument's even worse. They want to argue that it's silly for atheists to believe that life arose by chance. But the trouble is, it's creationists who's pushing the ideas that abiogenesis means life arising by chance. If you ask an origin of life researcher how life arose, they's going to tell you all about simple organic compounds interacting according to strictly deterministic natural laws. And that's the opposite of random chance. And creationists have been corrected on this point over and over and over again, and they just don't care. The notion of life arising by chance is a deliberate straw man that they put up only so they can knock it down without ever addressing or even acknowledging the actual science. And that's all Gosser and Turk do here. They quote Michael Behe, a creationist from the Discovery Institute, as saying that the odds of an amino acid arising by chance are really, really tiny. They argue that chance ain't really a cause because it's just a description of a probability and therefore it's nonsense to say that chance created life. <laughs> and, and then they end with this little gem. Quote, we shouldn't allow atheists to cover their ignorance with the word chance. End quote. And considering it's creationists and not atheists who's addicted to the word chance, I think it's kind of ironic that Gosser and Turk admit it's all just a cover-up for ignorance. And I'm sure there's more that could be said, but that's going to wrap it up for me for today. Next week, Gosser and Turk's going to lecture us all on the philosophy of science, which I'm sure they understand exactly as well as they do biology. Meanwhile, thanks for watching, and please be kind wherever possible.